Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning or good night. Welcome or welcome back to Crash Course Economics. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, attendees. Uh, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. And um, I myself, I'm Sarah, I'm the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition and I'm based at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, Netherlands. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Crawlsmith, a web developer, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl and Jenny Pannebecker, communications officer at SOMO, who are working very hard to make this webinar a success today. Now, let me introduce Crash Course to you too. Who are we? So we're a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we united at the start of the Corona crisis in order to understand what's happening during the crisis and also to reflect on ideas and solutions on how to solve the problems that arose. And also uh, that made the crisis appear in the first place. So Crash Course is a uh, online platform. It's designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and also make the necessary steps we need to make towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice, which was, of course, also very needed before the crisis started. And we're inviting global experts to break down complex, mainly financial or macroeconomic complex issues and make them accessible to all. And uh, in that way, we want to think about how to shape our economic system in a uh, just and democratic way. So our goal of this series is to democratize knowledge and to provide you with the necessary tools that you need to change the world. And we're organizing a webinar uh, every two weeks now until the mid of December. A handy to know for you is that um, there will be a recording, a podcast and also a transcript of today's webinar. And the recording of the former webinar with Ingrid Harbold van Graven is available online. Uh, and I'll show it to you at the end of this webinar. So now I'd like to hand over to uh, Rodrigo, who will tell you something about the first series and uh, also say more about the second series. Oh, uh, thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon uh, on this uh, very strange day that we are all uh, eagerly awaiting the results of uh, what is happening on the other side of the Atlantic that will, uh, well, uh, determine what will happen to the rest of us. But um, while we're waiting, we will uh, continue with this crash course. Um, so the first series uh, was about uh, monetary policies, uh, central banks, uh, and ideology um, in the wake of the, well, the COVID-19 induced crisis that uh, started in, in March this year. Uh, central banks uh, became, uh, well, temporarily, again, very important key players uh, in our global economy uh, and cont have continued to be that. Um, the second series uh, uh, tries to look at, um, well, the, the underlying structural problems uh, in the global south, developing countries, uh, um, before we discuss the current direct problems associated to the to the debt crisis. Before moving into the debt crisis itself, we would like to understand some underlying dynamics. Um, so that is what these first three episodes have been about. All right, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Um, I'll tell you something more about the setup of today's webinar. Uh, so it's always more or less the same. Uh, Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker. I will present her view in about 15 or 20 minutes. Thereafter, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions for her and we'll interview her for another, let's say 15, 20 minutes. And finally, we'll have a round of questions from your side and those will be read out loud by Rodrigo and me. So we hope to finish uh, within the hour. Um, I'd like to ask you if you have questions, don't put them in the chat, but put them in the special Q&A tab. Uh, you will find it in the bottom of your screen and we'll make a selection based on those questions. Uh, there's also the system of uploading questions. So if you like a question, you can upload it by putting the thumbs up and then uh, the most endorsed questions will appear at the top of our screen. So that's a very nice democratic system, uh, I think, to select questions. So Rodrigo, now you have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yes, <clears throat> well, uh, we are very happy to have uh, with us today uh, Eva Karwalski. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the Hertz University, um, and she's an economist, uh, but she uh, takes uh, a, a multidisciplinary approach, well, very serious, much more serious than 
other economists uh, tend to do and actually engages also with people from other disciplines. So that, that makes it very interesting. Um, uh, her work is focused on uh, large corporations uh, and how their behavior sh uh, is shaped by uh, a financialized setting. Uh, and uh, she uh, works primarily uh, on uh, the finan financialization uh, and development issues. Uh, and and that, therefore we think she's a very well equipped to discuss with us today what uh, makes financialization um, special uh, or interesting in uh, the global south. So I would like to give the floor to, to Eva and uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So today we will talk about what is subordinate financialization um, in this episode of Crash Course Economics. And you will realize I will also sometimes just refer to it as financialization in um, developing and emerging economies or sometimes also in emerging economies. We can talk about, if anyone is interested in terms of uh, the, the academic semantics, we can talk about that uh, in the Q&A maybe. But so just to give you a brief overview of what we will um, do today to kind of set, set up uh, the discussion is... I will first uh, define financialization briefly for you and then point towards its distinctiveness in terms of um, emerging markets and developing economies. And financialization is a very broad and actually very rich research area. So we won't have time to look at every single aspect, but once again, I encourage you to pick up things in the Q&A if there's something that uh, is particularly uh, of interest to you and we haven't discussed. However, we here will focus on the importance of financial liberalization and the ex external sector for financialization in emerging markets and developing economies, because that's actually one of the main drivers of financialization in these countries. And uh, yeah, it's basically, you will see, has quite severe consequences, economic and social consequences for these countries. So what is financialization? Um, you might have come across that term by now, even in the financial press, right? Uh, financial Times, more and more reports on it, interestingly. And so generally the term came up in the context of rich countries and uh, research on rich countries. And so it refers to um, the increased role of financial motives, financial markets, financial actors, and financial institutions in the operations of the domestic and international economies. This is a very broad definition, and it's, it has been criticized for that. But concretely, what you can think it is, it's a research agenda and kind of studies that show that, in fact, a financial sector doesn't always have positive impacts on the economy. If the financial sector is too powerful and too large, it can have very much detrimental uh, effects on real sector investment, employment. It can create financial instability and can contribute towards rising household indebtedness and even exaggerate inequality. So as I said, most of these observations have been first made in terms of Anglo-Saxon economies like the US and the UK who in the end are the countries who dominate the international financial structure. And this is where we come in here with the seminar because that subordination of emerging markets and developing economies is an outcome of the dominance of rich countries in the international sphere in international finance. Now, how does that look like? So to give you, as I said, a brief overview of the distinctiveness and the difference in terms of rich countries and poor countries and how financialization looks across uh, these two uh, regional areas of the world. Um, so if you look at this table here, in the top row, you've got rich countries, right? So the second row, I should say. And at the bottom, DEE, so developing and emerging economies, you've got uh, poor countries. And since I'm an economist, as Rodrigo mentioned, uh, we like to think about the five macroeconomic aggregates. So these five sectors in the economy of every state are, so on the one hand, that's the foreign sector, the state, the financial sector, and non-financial corporations and households. So we will focus today mostly on the foreign sector. And um, I guess from this um, 
table, it's not very surprising because as you can see here, just from the setup and where stuff is written and where there, is, uh, there isn't anything, um, in fact, in terms of uh, financiali financialization research, there is very little done in terms of the influence of, of the foreign sector on rich countries, whereas in the context of uh, poor countries, emerging markets, this is one of the main research areas. So the influence of liberalization of financial flows, but also things like exchange rate volatility um, and increasingly uh, more innovative foreign aid provision through um, blended finance, so through a mix of um, private sector and public sector sources, that's something that's really strong and uh, shaping policy and research there. So we will focus on that. And in that context, um, we will also talk about the role of the state and state policies, because in effect, um, every aspect of financialization and actually every aspect of uh, regulation generally is influenced by state institutions, which put that through and into place. If there's something else in terms of financial sector, NFCs or households that you would like to pick up in the discussion, we can come back to that later. So this graph here in terms of the financial um, reform index basically just shows you over time um, that massive push towards uh, opening up, deregulating and uh, financially liberalizing developing countries, including even developing countries in, in Africa. They generally are being regarded to, to be laggards in terms of financial liberalization. So I've given you here the um, Sub-Saharan Africa average, SSA, and a country that's uh, relatively open in comparison to the group, that's Nigeria, that's the blue line, and Ethiopia, a country that's relatively closed. So you can see kind of the range and the different experiences and the variegation, as we call it, in terms of country experiences. So what you, you can see in terms of um, opening up for cross-border flows, but also deregulating domestically, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has done that much, much less so than rich countries like uh, the UK, so Britain. Um, however, you still see this very strong tendency and this, this trend in terms of liberalizing and opening up throughout the 1980s and particularly the 1990s. Now, why is this important and what's, what was the consequence of that? The consequence of this opening up and the financial liberalization was very much um, an increase in financial inflows into developing and emerging markets. And so what you see here is foreign liabilities of uh, EMEs and developing economies, meaning their portfolio equity, so investors, foreign investors investing in uh, poor country equity, FDI, so foreign direct investment, and debt liabilities. Now, why is this a problem, what could you ask? Because in fact, uh, FDI is something that's uh, in theory great, right? You've got technology transfers linked to that and all kinds of other wonderful things. Why should that be something that we worry about? Let's look at these one by one. So for portfolio um, equity liabilities first, FDI after that, and then that, and let's link it to financialization. Now, portfolio inflows are very much uh, at, at the core of what researchers around financialization are worried about. And um, portfolio inflows are typically very short term in, in uh, their horizon. So these are investments into equity, for instance, and quite often they refer to as hot money because of that. Because basically there's no guarantee that that money will stay within a given uh, emerging economy. So you can experience as an economy, as a country, you can experience a sudden stop or, or an inflow reversal, particularly if this, there's something happening internationally, internationally, like um, quantitative easing in the US or UK being signaled to stop, as happened a couple of years ago. You had something called the, the taper tantrum, right? So um, the idea was, or the, the uh, announcement of the Fed was of the US central bank that interest rates finally might actually go up. And so international investors then basically thought, okay, great, then we start withdrawing money from South Africa, Brazil, Turkey, all these countries. And then they um, had the problem and very much experienced that in their exchange rates and the volatility of that exchange rates went up. 
Hence, if you uh, a savvy government in the global south, you put prudential policies into place, namely you start accumulating reserves, so mostly US dollars. What does that mean? Um, we will go through the mechanism in a, in a second, but uh, what you see here is the volumes of international reserves by held by EEs, so that's the table at the bottom, so emerging economies, uh, low middle income countries and least developed countries. And at the bottom in red, you've got high debt countries. So these are hippie countries, transition economies, economies that went from socialism to capitalism and oil and gas exporters. And what you see very clearly over time, so you've got three columns there, right? So 1990s, 2000 to 2007, and then after the crisis, 2008 to 2013. And you can see for all these countries on average, that's the, the figure in gray here, you had an increase from around 12% of GDP to 21% of GDP. So almost, uh, well, not quite, but this, uh, almost a doubling. And if you go and have a look at specific countries, so let's say oil and gas exporters, so that that's the last line, that actually increased by more than a factor of three, right? So that it more than tripled. Now, this is very prudential of these countries because it's a type of uh, precaution, right? So if you have a lot of money leaving, so it will leave your currency. And so investors will now want to exchange uh, the South African rand or whatever for US dollars. So you need that um, for an exchange. However, it comes at a cost and that's the problem. So reserves are costly. How do they work? So taking the example of Mexico, if Mexico wants to acquire some U.S. Treasury bonds, these tend to be still the most uh, popular in terms of foreign reserve acquisition. So that's uh, number one when you look at the different errors. If they want to do that, there will be in the international uh, foreign exchange markets a transaction where pesos and U.S. dollars are exchanged. But the Mexican central bank will have to finance this exchange somehow and what they typically do is they issue Mexican government bonds into the local uh, economy, into the domestic economy, and um, borrows there from commercial banks, domestic commercial banks, but also anyone else who really wants to buy uh, pesos denominated Mexican government uh, bonds. Uh, these can also be foreign investors, and so uh, these these foreign these investors do that because they then receive an interest payment. And here in the example, and that's 2016, that was six percent. Now, then the Mexican central bank can go out and um, buy U.S. Treasury bonds. They also yield an interest for the Mexican central banks. However, this interest, and that's where the cost comes in, is much, much lower. It's only 2%. So for the Mexican central bank, this is a cost. And therefore, it's a transfer really of resources from the global south, from poor countries to rich countries, particularly the US. But at the same time, this transaction here in the local market actually generates opportunities for foreign um, and domestic financiers to profit, right, for the domestic investors. Um, and you have an additional transfer in terms of resources from the public sector, from taxpayers in the end, uh, through the central bank to private, to the private financial sector. And this is also where financialization comes in because the central bank through these government bonds actually creates an instrument that's very safe and at the, at the same time lucrative in terms of uh, the interest rate. Now, so this is the main problem really with uh, inflows, particularly portfolio flows. And usually the idea is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, foreign direct investment actually is incredibly benevolent and brings about uh, investment and technology transfer and all these wonderful things. But in fact, looking at specific country experiences, that's not the whole story. You might actually import financialized behaviors into your economy because of FDI. So the example that I would like to share with you here is that of uh, Central Eastern Europe, so particularly the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. You can see here in the middle. Um, in this graph, which shows your household debt as share of GDP. 
And so there's a comparison here of two decades, the, the light gray bar, that's the 10 years before the financial crisis, and the dark gray bar is seven years or eight years after the financial crisis. And these, these little triangles, that's really what I would like to focus on, because that's the growth rate between these two. And the axis that goes along with that is the right-hand side axis, right? So basically what you see is that in the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland, credit to households over these two periods actually increased by a factor um, of 100% and in Poland more than 200%. So in Poland, actually, credit to households more than tripled over that period. Um, that contributes and fuels domestic household indebtedness. But at the same time, the problem in Central Eastern Europe, and particularly in the run-up to the financial crisis, global financial crisis, was that a lot of this debt was issued in foreign currency. So um, it's quite common in Poland and other uh, Central Eastern European countries to have a Swiss franc denominated mortgage, for instance, which you take on because typically the interest rates on these mortgages are much lower than on a Zwarte denominated credit. However, what you do is you import currency risk or yeah, into your household really, right? So you then have to start like following uh, exchange rate movements to kind of be say, sure that you can pay off your mortgage, which most people really don't do. Um, but every time there is a massive devaluation of the Zwarte, your debt burden, your real debt burden goes up massively. And this is what happened in 2008, 2009 in these countries. So that's problematic. So even FDI is problematic. And finally, looking at just debt, debt liabilities. Um, so these are loans by um, the government, right? So um, foreign loans from the foreign sector, from foreign banks, um, but also by non-financial corporations, NFCs, increasingly so, in fact, and uh, by the, the local banking sector, so the financial sector. Um, and the problem here, and this is what you see in the graph, is that most of this foreign debt across developing and emerging markets, because this is in percent, so this is uh, foreign denominated um, external debt. Uh, so you see euros in red and US dollars in gray um, as share of total external debt. So the majority of external debt is actually issued in a foreign currency. That's not true for all countries. There are exceptions where actually the, the um, local currency and, and uh, is quite strong, like South Africa, which I look at in more details. Um, but in fact, if you see for that whole group of poor countries, so um, middle and lower income countries, a vast majority, so almost 90% of all external debt is actually um, issued in euros and particularly in US dollars. So once again, you have this problem in terms of uh, exchange rate risk, right? And um, this is this is one aspect of, um, of your problems with uh, financialization as well. And um, these are the these are the three aspects that we mentioned in the beginning, right? So portfolio investment, FDI, and debt in the context of financialization and the uh, foreign sector. And if you would like to have a look at uh, some more literature, I've included some further readings as well. And I'm very happy to discuss that in more detail in the Q&A. Before asking some questions, I had um, um, yeah, more of a clarification question because I, I don't know if it's clear to to uh, everyone. Um, not everyone, of course, is a, is, is a, is a trained economist uh, looking at this. Uh, so I, perhaps you could explain a bit, uh, a, a, a bit longer, or yeah, elaborate a bit more on the sterilization. So the sterilization, if I understand correctly, is the the, the inflow of uh, all sorts of portfolio investments, money. Uh, foreign money coming into the country, um, bonds being emitted by a national uh, cor well, non-financial corporations or banks. And then the central banks, they have to sterilize this, take it out of 
markets out of transactions uh, in order to avoid uh, inflation. And uh, the sterilization uh, goes through uh, emitting national bonds or bonds denominated in a national currency uh, and buying uh, uh, bonds uh, denominated in dollars, mostly dollars or euro. And then there's a difference in the interest rate that they have to, well, that, that they receive for the the bonds they hold in in, in dollars that are very low, uh, and 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 what they have to pay in their national currency, which is very high. And so, and this this difference, that is the cost. Am I am I am I correct to to say this? Yes, absolutely. So let me just, if that's okay, I just share that uh, slide again. You're absolutely right. You're, you're kind of pointing towards the the one quite difficult and and technical slide here. Thank you. Yep. Um, yes. So and you bring in some some uh, heavy kind of macroeconomic uh, vocabulary as well. There, sterilization. Oh, you're absolutely yeah. right. So so in fact, um, the accumulation of reserves happens on the one hand because um, so reserves being uh, hard currency. Uh, denominated instruments like mostly actually U.S. Treasury uh, bonds, right? So T-bills, um, which we know, or some of you might know from the kind of discussion in, in the newspapers about um, China holding a lot of U.S. reserves, right? And so um, this happens because on the one hand, it's it's a, um, a precaution for emerging markets, as I mentioned. So once there um, is an inflow of uh, foreign uh, denominator or foreign investors want to in, invest into, let's say here, um, Mexican uh, equity, so so Mexican companies, let's say. So they come and obviously they pay initially, they, they've got uh, US dollars, right? And so there's an inflow of US dollars in into um, the, the Mexican economy. And um, sterilization basically yeah, tries to mop up, as economists would say, the kind of excess liquidity in the domestic um, economy. And that kind of is already something that's kind of, uh, you know, ideologically um, uh, tainted. So the, the idea is that if there's too much money, too much liquidity in the economy, there will be inflation, right? Which, interestingly, we haven't really seen in countries like the US or the UK, right? Yeah. People so Having uh, like, quant quantitative easing. Just, Sorry, yeah. just, just to add on this then... Um, this is an, another effect of quantitative, quantitative easing that is often neglected. Mm. And so not, not only are uh, uh, central banks uh, in the core of the global economy able to uh, well print much more money, much more easily than uh, well central banks in the periphery, but also the, the printing of money, to put it uh, in that way, in, in the core, creates additional costs in the South. Uh, uh, because of this need of sterilization, why? Because when the when the core countries, the central banks, and the core countries, uh, uh, well, they create so much liquidity. Some of this money goes into to developing countries, and then this needs to be sterilized by the central banks to avoid uh, inflation. Uh, and and so it, it 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 has it has these two problems. Then it creates for developing countries one that they are not able to compete with central banks in the core, of course, and um, yeah, and, that, and these additional costs. But I, w I, was, I was wondering, I, I don't know, I, this is a, perhaps a bit out of the, not part of the presentation, but if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Danny Roderick had pointed to this problem before the period of quantitative easing in I don't know, yeah. 2005 or something. Uh, yeah. And then he, he estimated the costs uh, around to 1% or something like that. I, I may be mistaken. One percent uh, of GDP in in the global South. Would you expect that this cost would be higher than now? Because of um, so yeah, there there is some good there is some good work, and uh, usually it's kind of a campus work that's the reference, right? But others like Ray and whoever um, also did some of that. I would think the cost has gone up, and you also see that in the kind of policy debate because in fact um, institutions like the OECD, so the kind of club of rich countries are slowly talking about the global financial uh, cycle, right? So, so there is more and more awareness that actually rich countries do impact poor countries with their monetary policy, which hasn't been be there before the, the global financial crisis. Um, I would expect um, that there is 
more of the cost. But interestingly, what this um, crisis has brought about, the COVID crisis, is that um, some emerging markets have also embarked onto quantitative easing, yeah. which wasn't there before. So actually, interestingly, during the um, global financial crisis, this was, com- and even before, before as well, right, this was completely out of the reach. So no one really thought this could be done by an emerging market um, currency because, you know, the idea would be that inflation would go up so much that you just couldn't do that. So we see the crisis does, I guess, give us some room for maneuver to bring in new policies, right? And actually argue our case that the, the, the ways we used to do stuff like orthodox economic mm-hmm. policy isn't necessarily what what will work and we should well, be more open-minded. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I would like to invite Sarah to come back. I don't know... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put to on my us. camera, but it's not really working at the moment. Maybe oh. uh, Jeremy could fix this behind uh, the scenes. But would you like me to continue, or do you do you want to ask a, a question? Oh, I think yeah, ah, it's yeah. working again. Good, good, now good, good. Us, yeah. I, I'm not having my best Zoom day, but this happens. Let's let's say it's the last bad, bad Zoom day of the year. Uh, Eva, thank you very much. So um, Rodrigo already asked uh, about also the dependency of. Uh, foreign uh, investors and uh, financiers. And my question is also related to that. Um, So uh, in a blog post I read by you, uh, you discussed the conflict between democracy and the economic order. Um, So one aspect of this conflict uh, lies in the prioritization of the interests of you call the market people. So that's private sector or bondholders, uh, as opposed to common people, the voters, us, let's say. And in Crash Course, we already discussed this uh, before with uh, Benjamin Brown. Uh, everyone that's interested can uh, also re-watch or listen uh, to this webinar. Um, and you discuss it in the context of the Brexit, which is, I think, very uh, apt and interesting. But I can imagine that this problem of economic order being stronger than democracy, overruling democracy, uh, might be bigger in the global south, uh, where we have a lot of countries where democracies are not super developed yet or eh, very much entrenched into institutions. Is this also uh, what you find in your uh, comparative research that if there's a weaker democracy, that Mm -hmm. the dominance of the economic uh, sector and thus uh, the interests of the market people are uh, better protected there? Mm, absolutely, that's that's a great question. And so, yeah, in, in terms of financialization, in, in my view, that's that's something that's really at the core. So, um, as you say, the market people, but particularly financial investors, are now being kind of elevated in terms of the importance of their opinion and their their views and demands vis a vis vis a vis governments who uh, issue debt, right? And they're kind of dependent on these people to to buy it or roll it over, buy it again. And so um, my case study and uh, the country I, I work a lot on is South Africa. And um, South Africa actually um, has very strong institutions and even and a strong uh, democratic uh, context. But even within a country like that, financialization has run such havoc that it actually started um, hollowing these institutions out and um, undermining um, them in two ways. So it, once through kind of um, slowing down and, and um, weakening growth, which then um, heightens all kinds of distributional conflicts, right? So um, heightens uh, the, the need for um, resources, scarce resources actually being um, uh, allocated in a, in, a, in a certain way. And so um, what, what you see in South Africa really is that the current, if you've heard of that, the, the state capture debate, so the kind of Zuma government having been uh, implicated in all kinds of dodgy deals um, with uh, foreign, but also kind of uh, domestic um, uh, investors, individuals, groups of individuals. All of that actually has been strongly facilitated through international finance, because in the end, um, particularly kind of foreign uh, interests that... uh, where part of 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 the Zuma shenanigans managed to uh, take out a lot of money uh, from South Africa abroad, and that wouldn't have been able without uh, the helping hand of international banks, but also um, auditors, lawyers. Um, yeah, so and I, I think that's that's one of the major areas where we really need some some policy reform and some some better regulation. 
Okay. Um, I would like to ask a, a question related to this. Um, so in, in in South Africa, uh, but also in uh, in Brazil, for instance, you see uh, well, a very strong national economic uh, and political elite uh, with, with a big stronghold over the over the economy, uh, which is perhaps uh, different in, in in countries in Eastern Europe, where you have much more dominance of Western Northern Western uh, uh, multinationals and banks over the economy. Uh, how, how how do you see this playing out in these countries with with yeah. a very different composition of uh, national economic and political elites? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say once again that unfortunately, um, so the, the strong financial and in in uh, Central Eastern Europe, as we mentioned in the presentation, to some extent, right? So. Um, in, in uh, countries like uh, Hungary and Poland, for instance, you have close to 80-90% uh, of the domestic banking sector being owned by like Western Western European banks. Um, and so in, in that context, actually, um, there is quite a bit of backlash, not just against foreign, um, foreign financial interests, but also um, foreign companies generally um, in the countries them being identified as one of the problems um, why the countries aren't, aren't developing faster, um, particularly linked to, let's say, you know, once again, taxes not being paid, but this is kind of uh, given to them as, as like an incentive to come and kind of invest in Poland. Um, so unfortunately, I mean, if you compare that to South Africa, you can have... Uh, whether you've got domestic or foreign investors and and kind of companies behaving dodgily, like it 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 can happen, it can happen both, right? Um, but arguably, um, if you manage to engage uh, productive domestic um, companies into uh, employment creation and support them through a strong domestic financial system, you can actually also, um, through policy, try to generate like a benevolent um, cycle, right? Like a, um, a virtuous cycle rather than just a vicious cycle as been, we've been kind of um, talking about in, in these examples. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, ask a different type of question. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in, in, in the figure that you showed, uh, you had this uh, 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 regulation index. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, which you see it's sort of converging towards the same, uh, well, position. Uh, over, you see a deregulation everywhere. Uh, and of course, uh, much of the deregulation in, in, in developing countries was uh, pushed forward by uh, the IMF and the World Bank in times of debt crisis, uh, the structural adjustment programs, and so on. Uh, so, if we if we look at this from the lens of uh, uh, Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism, that uh, well, you, you can use or abuse or misuse a, a crisis uh, as a catalyst for more market-oriented reforms. Uh, how do you how do you see well, related to that? I have two two questions. So, how, how do you see the, the the current prospects for more or deepening uh, of of reforms that would strengthen financialization in in, in developing countries? And secondly, how would a, a sort of a counter narrative uh, look like? Because uh, if you look at uh, how, for what, for example, the, the OECD is projecting uh, or is, is analyzing, it's the only way to, you can achieve uh, some form of uh, uh, yeah, progress or development is by opening up, by uh, uh, letting uh, multinational corporations come into your countries and do whatever they like without mm. foreign direct investments, uh, you will never be saved. Uh, so you need to... So the, all the reforms and the, the whole narrative is geared towards a deepening of this financialization. Mm. Absolutely. And and you're pointing towards um, an interesting policy discourse there, because, yes, generally, you know, there, there tends to be this kind of uh, recommendation to further uh, open up and, and liberalize. And you've seen that very clearly in, in that graph for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
and that view you know just kind of completely abstracts from from any type of history right because those countries that historically um, have been able to catch up so eastern uh, east asian um, economies that now even have joined uh, the OECD, the, the rich country club, right? These countries just did a completely different approach, um, right? So they, they didn't, didn't just open up and they didn't just deregulate. And I guess it's um, this is an old debate in, in development economics as well, right? And and um, economists and uh, um, have been critical about that. Um, unfortunately, this is a small group of economists for, um, for decades and decades. Um, and it seems that the, the kind of policy discourse always tries to just uh, get rid of that aspect um, of, of history. So generally, we, we need much stronger regulation and um, we should actually start in, in the core, right, in rich countries. Because if, if in the core we were actually able to regulate banks much better and hold them accountable if they support, uh, in cases where they support, and it's 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 proven, right, where they support uh, money laundering from like, you know, drug cut tells and other internationally very damaging industries if we um if we actually kind of came together and were able and willing to um stop tax evasion and tax avoidance which is also a massive problem from for the global south that would already do quite a bit and support poor countries uh, a long way yeah thanks eva so um I think I'll post the last question before we go uh, to the Q&A, which is, I think, also related to this question of Rodrigo about the counter-narrative. So recently, uh, due to the financial crisis, but specifically now also in the context of the corona crisis, there have been a lot of calls, for example, for uh, Bretton Woods 2.0, right, with capital controls mm. and limited liberalization of trade and finance, also to counter this uh, disaster capitalism and much more stronger financial regulation in general. At the same time, globally, uh, there's a discussion taking place about uh, green deals, like a Green New Deal, European Green Deal, uh, and that's going to cost a lot of money and might also imply mm -hmm. financialization, right? Or at least we need a specific financial system to be able that the money gets there where it's supposed to be. So, uh, yeah, one of the biggest questions now, I think, is how do we finance these kind of green deals? And, um, yeah, so... Stemming from your perspective, what kind of financialization could we envision uh, today that does not subordinate the real economy and does not benefit the market people, but that could provide the adequate mechanisms uh, that are needed to finance these green deals and that the problems that these green deals are addressing? Or, uh, well, that's a bit of a devil's advocate counter question. Do you think that more financialization is just not the answer and it's only a problem? Mm. So, yeah, I mean, you're going to the core of, of, of the um, argument there, right? So generally, financialization is, is um, seen very critically by, by people who, who, um, who research it. And in fact, I would probably, um, I agree with you that we need uh, sustainable finance, which supports a green deal and, you know, a generally more, more just and, and um, better structured economies across the global south and the global north. And I think once finance actually does work to support production and job creation, then I wouldn't actually call it financialization anymore. Um, but, you know, so, um, I mean, what, what is right, and you also point towards that in, in, in your question, we can't just go back to how things went in the 1950s or 1960s. That just is not going to work. We also have very different challenges today. Um, I think what the, the corona crisis maybe did show us in terms of how things are can be financed um, and uh, you know some countries deal better with them than others but it has shown us that um, you know austerity and and the levels of, of debt and how debt is managed uh, the levels of debt that particularly rich countries can endure are much much higher than what we might have thought until now and uh, something similar might actually be true for for emerging economies given this kind of quantitative easing example um but we we will have to think slowly about like how how to manage that going forward um and i would kind of caution very much because in fact there is um since the financial crisis 2008 2009 there has been already a narrative trying to kind of say look um we can further deepen and engage the private sector um in terms of financial markets to use finance for like a more humanitarian um, 
outcome, right? So like finance with a human face and all of that. And um, as always, it really depends on the design of, of uh, financial instruments and, and uh, how institutions behave. So I would very much caution against stuff like so floating around uh, things like social impact bonds, where you try to bring in financial um, investors and have some type of hybrid um, instrument that supports um, social provision, so, so instruments and, and social um, services that usually the state would provide, but they are done in such a way um, that in the end, the financial, the financial investor, uh, if it works out, gets a profit. And that's very problematic because, in fact, um, once again, we kind of shifting responsibilities and the focus away from, from the people, from civil society and from democratically elected institutions towards um, financial markets being those institutions and people who actually shape um, instruments and policies. And I think that's something that's incredibly problematic and, and uh, needs also much more attention in the policy discourse. And we should really be quite wary about not giving up um you know scrutiny democratic scrutiny of um, financial arrangements just because we think they're too complex so they are a question that technocrats should discuss and not us as society i guess that's also a bit uh, the goal of crash course right to make yes uh, perfect this exactly. kind of technocratic knowledge uh, more accessible and, and democratize it so thanks mm -hmm. that's a very elaborate answer i think um I'd like to say to uh, all attendees that uh, your remarks and questions in the chat might be reformed into questions to the Q&A tab so we can uh, take them into account while selecting uh, questions. And I think, Rodrigo, uh, it's time we start with the Q&A and you have the honor to ask the first one. Oh, I think you're on you're mute. Still, still. Yeah, you're still muted. <laughs> Sorry. Another thing, I think, I don't know if we mentioned it, that people can vote uh for questions so it's it's, it's not us um, rigging the system but it's uh simply uh well the, que the question that has most uh, thumbs up that, that we're gonna ask so the first is by uh we just changed but I, i'll just continue with what i was going to ask is uh is by uh Oron diba consultancy i hope i i pronounce it right um so the question is so the USA uh, is dependent on uh, the third world countries. I mean, if the USA needs money because it's going down, then third world debt will be the way to get money, which destabilizes these third world countries. That's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's a long question. It is. So, I mean, the the... The situation, I guess, is is uh, is always with finance is a bit more complex, right? And so, um, you know, apologies from my side that if I haven't, I, I couldn't quite bring in as much nuance as I might be able to in like a, you know a proper lecture to students. Um, but so, in fact, when we talk about you know um, countries holding each other's um, uh, debt, so uh, treasury bills, for instance, because I, I think that's that's what is alluded here to. Um, quite often, it's specific agents within these countries as well, right? So um, it's it's not necessary just Mexico and the um, Mexico holding U.S. treasury bills. Bills it's the Mexican central bank, but then might there might also be Mexican commercial banks and other other institutions holding um, holding uh, debt there. And now, um, I mean, yes, you know, uh, we all live in this international financial structure. However, unfortunately, poor countries, so emerging markets, um, as I said, they kind of subordinated in, in, in there because um, they entered. Um, a system that's dominated by some big um, countries like the US and the dominance that the US holds is unfortunately the attractiveness and the kind of safe haven character of the US dollar. So, um, you know, even though, um, even if, uh, let's say, uh, third world countries were to stop, so let's say governments from third world countries were to stop holding US treasury bills as reserves, there would be a lot of private sector um, uh, agents and actors in third world countries that would might still want to hold um, uh, US treasury bonds or other US denominated instruments because um, they're safe. Um, and 
all kinds of other international um, actors from from other countries would still hold on to the U.S. dollar. So, and as you've seen, I mean, one of the dominances and and the the kind of the entrenchment of that U.S. dollar dominance, um, you could see actually in the, in that graph that I showed about the. Um, denomination of external debt in poor countries. So since the global financial crisis in 2008, even though it was predicted that the US dollar would uh, decline because the crisis started in the US, actually um, you saw an increase, massive increase in um, US denominated um, emerging market uh, based, uh, um, based debt because uh, it's just a safe haven currency. Just, just as a very brief uh, sort of clarification question. Um, mm. So isn't it so much, uh, that for the US it is insignificant uh, uh, what this demand for uh, treasury bills is from developing countries, relatively insignificant, uh, but for this, uh, the central banks from these countries, it is essential that they buy these uh, treasury bills. Uh, so that, that, that is the nature of this unequal power relation that for the one it is really unimportant while the other cannot live without it uh, yeah i would i would i would agree with you and i mean to, the only potential exception is really china right because it's yeah. it's yeah. so massive yeah okay sarah yes thanks eva we're going to the next question which is by elspeth crawford uh, Elspeth writes, financialization seems to be just another way to exploit those who are not set up to defend their local economy. Also, the rich countries have a much greater carbon footprint than emerging market economies and DE, I think, developing economies. What discussion of financialization recognizes that there is a climate crisis looming as well as economic crisis and that they probably fuel each other, fuel being here a good, I guess, wordplay. <laughs> good work. Um, yeah, I mean that's absolutely that's that's um, another aspect of of what's going on of the global challenges today, and in fact, so we haven't talked about that, and I haven't flagged it even in in my in my overview. That's that's a good point. That's an omission. So unfortunately, finance kind of uh, manages to creep into all the little um, nooks and crannies uh, of of our um, daily and and uh, social life, and so there are uh, financial instruments that actually try to take advantage of of nature and um, land particularly. So, um, and you know, there, there are actually um, proposals to try and um, use financial markets also to, um, to, to right the wrong of, of, um, of uh, climate change. So that's, that's definitely kind of uh, a topic that, that is strongly linked um, to financialization. Uh, even though it, it it does need much more attention, I agree. And you're right in terms of um, you know it's 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 easy nowadays for rich countries to to point the finger towards China and other emerging economies with with heavy industry and a, a big uh, carbon footprint. Because in fact, if if we look at that cumulatively cumulatively over the last hundred years or so, we've actually done the most damage here, and and we really um, really need to uh, sort our act out and historically once again, if we look to kind of the 1970s or so and the, the new economic order, at some point we did promise um, developing countries and emerging markets that we would engage in technology transfer um, to, to support them. And this is really what's needed now to kind of um, transfer technologies which are green and clean to give those countries that are the biggest polluters at the moment. But because technology is not owned by governments but tend to be owned by corporations and there are patents that attached and money interests and all kinds of other things that's a very difficult political question so this is a plea for more uh, state ownership if i hear you correct <laughs> that as well yeah Interesting. And, Interesting. and intervention potentially right exactly. i think that this brings us to a, a, another question um j just in between uh unilever you know the, the british the anglo dutch company uh, that's maybe moving to the uk what well, it originated by stealing patents from Germany because at the time in the Netherlands there was no uh, uh, rule of law for this. Uh, so this is how uh, uh, this uh, multinational started by stealing technology. So um, we should not forget very, forget very that. Very entrepreneurial, the, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could you could label it like that. That's uh, how how they would like to see it. Uh, another question by um, Pete Jonker. 
um, he, he states, uh, am I correct that your argument can be summarized as one, uh, emerging economies need foreign currency in order to import technology, for instance, smartphones. Two, domestic financial institutions are funding this uh, on the international capital market. Three, this increases the need for central banks for foreign currency, currency reserves. Four, increased reserves cause a transfer of resources from the public sector to the private sector. And five, uh, this causes more financialization of the domestic economy. If correct, I need an explanation of the link between three and four, given the fact that central banks uh, can also create domestic money. So in three was the increase, the, the increasing, increasing the need uh, for central bank, uh, uh, sorry, for foreign currency reserves. And four is increased reserves cost a transfer of uh, resources from the public sector to the private sector. Mm. It's a bit of a long question, but... It, um, it is elaborate. Um, so I guess someone is pointing there towards uh, endogenous money theory, which... which um, I just kind of, you know, just kind of, if, if you're interested in that, go go have a look at that. Um, but so in basically in, in rich countries, it's true that you, you don't have a lot of these problems because um, you have a sovereign um, currency and, and you don't necessarily need to engage in, um, in uh, reserve accumulation to the same extent to kind of be safe from um, uh, volatility of your exchange rate, even though since the financial inter, the financial crisis of two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, that's not not all that um, all that straightforward anymore, um, because European banks, for instance, back then also had a massive shortage of dollars, um, which uh, helpfully was was uh, remedied by the the Federal Reserve itself. So um, I would say in the global south, one of the major problems is that um, the governments and the local central banks just don't have a hard currency themselves. That's really the main um, problem they face. And um, it's not just that they need to import and that's why they need foreign exchange. Um, that's kind of one of the factors, but there's also um, money flowing in, right? Um, because local uh, financial instruments actually, so let's say Mexican, South African, Brazilian, whatever, financial instruments are much more attractive. They have higher interest rates. Um, so that's when sterilization, as we discussed, kicks in. So things are a bit more complex and internationally interlinked than they look, especially because on the other hand, you can say, um, in fact, um, rich country investors, they need the global south and these high interest rates um, because they are a very profitable um, outlet for them to to make money, particularly in the context of, let's say, pension funds and the shortfall of, of um, financial gains there. Thanks. So, just uh, some clarification. So, um, yeah. basically, it is not really the imports of goods, consumer goods, of, of capital goods, uh, that uh, causes um, or th that leads to the need to sterilize, uh, but it's much more the inflow of financial flows uh, because th these are also the ones that make the that increase the circulation of of money and potentially create inflationary risks. Exactly. And if you look at kind of the development, and this is what financialization is actually about, if you look at the development of um, financial transactions vis-a-vis -vis trade transactions over the last 30, 40 years, they have increased much more um, in, in volume, in complexity as well, um, than, than trade. Right. So, Eva, we're approaching, I think, the last question. Um, just one clarification question, which you can answer, I think, in, in 10 seconds is by uh, Kaustaf K. Why is it called subordinate financialization? Is it because developing economies are being subordinated or something else? And then mm -hmm. the question I wanted to ask is the one by Panos Stamoulis. Um, he's asking about, uh, is FDI really connected with household debt? And I mean, causally, what is the connection there between those two? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, subordination basically um, tries to, to point towards the fact that 
the global south and poorer countries are in the hierarchy in the international hierarchy much much further down so there's a subordination in in different spheres and that actually comes you know from from a long um long research tradition uh, latin american tradition as well right um in 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 economics um and uh, i i myself tend to as i said in the beginning actually use um, financialization of emerging uh, markets and developing countries um but that's that's just kind of preference uh, in terms of uh, uh, highlighting agency versus structure but yeah, um, yeah i'm sorry we, we push you a little bit into this I'm yeah, sorry yeah for no that. no that, no yeah. that's absolutely fine and i you know there's there I, I very much i agree with the term um but mm. you know there there probably kind of people uh, which who are much more um qualified than me to, to i just don't want to take ownership of, of this term because you know people like you should look for people like Jeff Powell and Nina Kaltenbrunner for their publications. They've written excellent stuff on that. And actually in the references that I provided, there is a piece by um, Bonisi, uh, Kaltenbrunner and Powell and they they summarize that excellently. Um, it's also in this. Now, exactly. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, now having gone off on a tangent a little bit, sorry, I've forgotten the second question. Yeah, there was uh, whether <laughs> FDI, yeah, sorry, this, it's a lot of mm. questions at the same time, whether FDIs are connected uh, with household debt yeah. and what the causal connection there. Yeah. Um, so what we've observed, particularly ac across uh, Latin America, but also in Central Eastern Europe, is that um, the link is one that once particularly foreign banks entered these countries, there has been a change in the lending patterns, so in the behavior of these banks. So it does make it, it does make a difference where capital or companies, where they come from. Um, so it's, it's not that, you know, it, it, uh, it's just kind of wonderful to, to have these inflows and they, then they do kind of impartially uh, whatever they can for, for the local economy. Obviously, um, once you have foreign direct investment and FDI always refer to a stake in a company which is 10% or more. So the idea is that there's actually control being taken and influence being exerted by this foreign investor. And so particularly in, in Central Eastern Europe and Latin America, we've seen a massive shift towards um, extending mortgages and consumption credit um, rather than supporting uh, companies, manufacturing industry and stuff like that uh, in these countries. So yes, there, there, is, there is a link and if you want through the agency of this comp these companies. All right, Eva, thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid we need to wrap up. There's still some questions in the Q&A uh, tab, but we try to uh, pose as many questions as possible. And thank you for answering them uh, in such a brief period of time, Eva. Um, and sorry for the, for the technical problems. We're blaming it on Zoom and on the US elections where uh, Western uh, or sorry, US imperialism is still uh, governing uh, the world. Uh, but Biden is still uh, at the top. For now, thanks a lot uh, to all for participating. So um, Eva's PowerPoint and references will be put online shortly and also a recording uh, of this webinar as well as a podcast version and a transcript. And our next session will be on the 19th of November. They will be featuring Dominic Brown, who will be, be discussing the question of how to confront debt in the global south. And if you want to keep uh, updated, please sign up uh, to our newsletter, which I'll show you in a second. Um, yes. That's over here. This is our website, Crash Course. This is the fourth one. Um, and here at the bottom, you can sign up by clicking here. And if you do that, uh, we'll keep you updated about uh, the recording of this webinar and also uh, the next one, and you won't miss anything. So on behalf of uh, Rodrigo and me, thank you so much for being here with us today. And Eva, thank you so much uh, for sharing your view. I hope you all learned a lot. I did for sure. And uh, we'd love to see you next time. So um, stay safe and see you the next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye.